So, you've been assigned to teach public speaking. It's not essay writing, and it's not theater. We want to make the experience as beneficial for our students as possible. We want them to leave our classroom empowered, inspired, and confident in their skill sets. But who has the time to read research and go to workshops? That's where I come in. My name is Julian, and you're listening to the Public Speaking Educators Forum. This podcast is for educators who teach public speaking. Each week, you'll hear from a fellow instructor who has an interesting trick to the trade to share with you. We are speaking up so that you can help your students to speak up too. Tonight on the forum, we'll be talking with Dr. Meggie Mapes, who is the Introductory Course Director of Public Speaking at the University of Kansas. Dr. Mapes is a graduate of Southern Illinois University, where she specialized in rhetoric and political communication. Recently, she has been tasked with a major curricular revision of the general education public speaking course at the University of Kansas, which will be the focus of our conversation tonight. Maggie, welcome to the forum. Thank you for having me. We appreciate your time, especially as we are approaching midterms and um, during a semester that is certainly unlike others. <laughs> and the third one now we're going on, I think that's unlike any other, so. <laughs> yes. So um, you are the basic course director at your university, and um, I know that that, of course, comes with course coordination, administrative, and other assessment responsibilities. So would you mind telling us a little bit about your roles in that capacity? Yeah, absolutely. So I started as um, introductory course director at the University of Kansas in 2017. And primarily, I manage three courses, though functionally two. We have an introductory course, which is our public speaking class. We do approach it in a more traditional public speaking manner. And then we also have an honors version of that course and a third 300 level public speaking course that focuses specifically on business and professional communication. So my role um, is to take care of those courses functionally. And also because we're a PhD granting institution, I supervise many of the GTAs and the instructors that oversee those courses. So that means training incoming GTAs, um, assessing, doing programmatic assessment, selecting or making changes to any of the curriculum to both of those public speaking and business public speaking courses. I'm trying to find ways to advocate and locate resources for undergraduate students. Um, those I would say primarily in a nutshell would be what I'm supposed to be doing in that role. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned TAs, and I assume they probably teach a lot of uh, the 100-level courses. So what are some of the things that you instill in them when you're training them to teach a, an introductory-level communication or public speaking course? So if you could just kind of walk me through some of the principles that you give them. Yeah, that's a good and really hard question. I think one thing that's difficult is there are GTAs who are coming in that are master students, so they have had no experience teaching, or we have PhD level students who have experience in their master's program or have taught at other institutions. So trying to sort of find a balance when we're talking about pedagogy across those different experience levels is one barrier. But I think my goal is to really allow them to think both um, kind of abstractly and strategically or practically about questions related to teaching. So I'm, I am not someone as a course director who will give you a binder full of exactly every single lesson, every single assignment, every activity that you're going to do in, court, in the course. Um, instead, you know, our goal is to kind of build resources around core principles about public speaking so that you're supported, but to also really invite instructors to ask questions about their decision making practices as a teacher. That means saying, um, rather than saying, this is what is good or bad about teaching, instead trying to get instructors to really ask themselves, you know, what's at stake if I make this decision? What kind of principles or what values am I using or do I believe to be true um, if I think about teaching in this way? So for me, because I um, in terms of my research, really identify as someone who does critical pedagogy. I get a lot of teachers or instructors, just like I was when I was a new teacher, who thought that they had to really replicate the experience of teaching in the exact same way that they had experienced it. And sometimes that's really great. 
Um, but sometimes it's really important to have them ask questions about why they're doing something, especially in a course like an introduction to communication course, where you are dealing with students from across the university who have all different backgrounds and experiences. Um, and so really asking questions, both in terms of what they're teaching, you know, why is this important and how do I want to teach it? But you know, overall, when we think about teaching as a practice, you know, um, what are what are the values that I believe in? Where did they come from? And really constantly and continuously reflecting on that. And I found that because they're across all those experience levels, doing internal mentoring and having GTAs work with one another as, as mentors um, and challenging each other can be a really effective way to get them to problem solve around teaching. Well, it's great to hear that you're basically helping them cultivate their own teaching philosophies. You know, I think, and I don't mean to say this in a disrespectful way, but I think when you hear course director or course manager, they kind of seem more like the, this is the way you're going to do it. You're going to use this syllabus. You're going to use these test questions, so on and so forth. I think it's great that you're taking an approach where you're you're helping them decide what the how they teach. You're, you're essentially teaching them to develop their own teaching ideals, their own teaching philosophy, their own teaching mentality, whatever word you'd like to use. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think because I work at a research institution, sometimes GTAs come to the institution because they want to practice being researchers. And this, you know, reframing teaching as something that is um, really, it's really hard. You know, it is really, really difficult and that it is related to scholarship and it affects students' everyday practices, I think can really, really reframe for a lot of GTAs what they're doing in graduate school and change what they want to do when they leave graduate school. You know, rather than a kind of, you know, this is right and this is wrong and this, this is exactly what you need to be doing, rather than that kind of mentality, which, you know, for me and my experiences with that sort of stripped away creativity, it kind of it sort of took away a lot of my critical thinking skills because I didn't have to question what I was doing. So I am much more interested in thinking about um, kind of broader questions about the nature of teaching and really helping instructors develop a teaching persona that they can use in any class they teach, any communication course for the rest of their careers. That is wonderful. I applaud that wholeheartedly. And, <laughs> Thanks. And actually, you just sparked a new question. You mentioned research. And I think when you're looking at a course that is more or less taught very similarly across sections, I don't want to say exactly the same because there's, of course, autonomy, but it's very easy to use that as material for a research study or for doing scholarship in terms of pedagogy or whatever the case may be. So have you integrated any research activity or any kind of scholarship into your role as course director? Great question. Um, I, I'll answer that in two ways. The first is I'm really lucky that in my role, I have an entire introductory course office. So I have three graduate student, PhD graduate students who work with me as assistant introductory course directors. And one thing I've really tried to do over the past few years is to instill research and publishing as a practice that we do in the office. So um, that might mean recently we had a publication that came out in basic course annual that really looked at um, how can critical media literacy skills be something that as public speaking instructors, we think about integrating? What would that look like? We've done communication teacher articles. So in that role as kind of a small working group, uh, pedagogy as research absolutely becomes instilled. I would say second is that while it isn't kind of across the board in the pedagogy graduate, the graduate pedagogy class that I teach, I absolutely try to get instructors to understand that any area of research that they are interested in in terms of communication, so intercultural communication, for example, intergroup, new media communication, all of those can be integrated into classroom or, or pedagogy questions to better understand um, core concepts about teaching at those intersections. Um, so I, I have found in the past few years that more graduate students in our program are publishing in the kind of pedagogy area because they are able to merge questions about rhetoric and pedagogy, um, for example, and really kind of reframe classrooms or teaching practices more broadly um, as areas of potential research questions. 
And do you find yourself mentoring these these graduate students in terms of scholarship, such as designing research studies or even just down to asking the right questions? Do you find that that becomes part of your role, like you're almost mentoring them in scholarship as well as teaching? I do, and I'm lucky to be able to do that in my role. I think one, one benefit of being a course director um, at a level with graduate students is that you really do come into contact and get to know every graduate student pretty well. And in that way, it does allow us to continue a relationship, even if I don't serve on their committees or even if I don't have them in another graduate course, where hopefully they know they can come to me with questions about pedagogy or, or looking at a manuscript, for example, that might be related to, to pedagogy questions. So yeah, absolutely. It, it's been one of the best parts of my role. And also I'm lucky to have uh, colleagues in my department, other faculty members who also really see the value in that work and support that kind of scholarship. Well, it sounds like the graduate students that come through your department are getting some wonderful training in a lot of different areas. I hope so, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we can do is cross our fingers yeah. and hope for the best, right? <laughs> Especially nowadays, yeah. Yes. <laughs> So now I understand, uh, kind of changing, shifting gears for a moment, I understand that you are working on a revision of your basic public speaking course, and you're sort of moving toward the direction of digital public speaking. I'm not sure if that's entirely based on um, the pandemic and all of its all of the joyous things that have come along with it, or if that was if that had been maybe an institutional priority even before COVID-19. But can you tell me a little bit about that? process, that initiative, what launched it, so on and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, in like I said, I began in the fall of 2017. And one of the first conversations that we have in a graduate pedagogy course is really about what are assumptions within public speaking and what are kind of areas that we could advance. And so they read an article that really asks us to confront the tendency to focus significantly more on speech writing and content and argument and research and have kind of lost other areas of public speaking as a more embodied practice, including how public speaking has become more significant in an online or digital environment. And for me, I got my PhD at Southern Illinois University, and I, I did a lot of classes in performance studies. So that speaks to a lot of my interest in public speaking, because you know, acknowledging that if public speaking is in fact an area of intense fear for many people, part of that is because they're so fearful of having that entire audience judge their embodied experience. So that's what sparked our broader conversations about not only just public speaking more broadly and how we wanted to teach it, but acknowledging that public speaking in digital spaces is something that, in my experience, I felt like our discipline hadn't really reconciled with in the same way, or uh, noticed that the tendency was to try to superimpose all of our face-to-face -face public speaking practices into a digital environment. Um, and for me, even as I tried to teach, especially when we transitioned uh, online because of COVID, when I taught last summer um, public speaking online, really realizing that many of those face-to-face -face practices not only felt and read and were communicated to me by students as uncomfortable, but they did not replicate actual scenarios where students might find themselves giving presentations online. So that really has asked us as an introductory course office to say, um, you know, where are resources in our discipline where we can try to reconcile what's happening that COVID has in many ways forced us to reconcile? And if there aren't those resources, how can we come together collectively as a discipline to try to, to, try to think about best practices um, to, to, to deal with, in my view, this big absence? So um, that's, that's really where we are. We've always, for the last year or so, we've really tried to test a couple of changes and many of those 
aren't forced to their example activities that graduate students can utilize. One of those, for example, is just having students try to create their own YouTube channel. So if you were gonna create a YouTube channel, what kind of information would you need to know about the audience? If you're gonna do like a, a makeup YouTube channel or a Pokemon YouTube channel, um, what kind of expectations are there for that sort of genre? And how could you craft a two to three minute introductory YouTube speech? So that's been kind of one thing we've played with. There's been a lot of really, really good feedback, but it is difficult because many of these formats don't necessarily match the definition of public speaking that we've held on to for so long as a discipline. So it is difficult moving forward to try to reconcile this moment that we're at in a way that is still consistent um, with you know, the traditions of public speaking. So let me ask you this. Now that you're including all this technology and virtual applications of public speaking in the curriculum, has the response from the other faculty been positive overall? I will say that I am lucky in my role to to really, really be 100 percent supported by faculty in the department. And I, I think I you know, one benefit of graduate students kind of coming in and learning that role is they are so open to different experiences in terms of what teaching public speaking might look like. And even for many of the graduate students who may have taught in our introductory course for the past four or five years, moving from master's to PhD, they're eager and interested to really try out new ideas about public speaking. So I haven't found internally anyway, any real resistance to many of these concepts. I have in, in doing published work, I have received some fact, you know, peer reviews that have really, you know, tried to, to ask that I consider what's the impact from a disciplinary perspective, if we begin using more new media best practices, for example. So just raising questions that we're always raising, which is how can we make sure there's uniqueness to the discipline to justify its continued existence on university campuses? But other than that, which you know, those questions aren't unique to public speaking or digital public speaking, I think I am lucky that COVID has also really spotlighted the need for us to be helping with many of these skills that we're experiencing every single day. Now, as far as instilling technology, you mentioned a couple things like a YouTube channel and things like that. What would you recommend be included as far as tech training in the gen ed public speaking course? That is a really good question. And I think it depends on, you know, the real goals or outcomes that a course wants to have. So, and, and there also does, of course, have to be a willingness for an instructor to recognize that an assign, assigning a piece of technology, even using YouTube, for example, absolutely has to come with some sort of training or information from the instructor to students. Because one thing we don't wanna do as instructors is really assume that every single student that comes into our course is super educated about all different types of technology, because we know that's not the case. So I do think that there are opportunities for us to create or try to imagine scenarios where students might be using digital public speaking without only meaning that they have to integrate a bunch of bells and whistles into the course. So for me, for example, you know, having a cursory understanding of YouTube um, was something that I was already comfortable with and being able to talk with and survey students about their level of comfortability allowed me to make adjustments to lesson plans about, you know, what kind of conversations do we need to have about YouTube? What are some examples that we need to look at about uploading a YouTube video, for example? Um, what are some sample YouTube videos that we would watch? in the same way that we would watch, you know, a sample TED Talk video um, that they would try to replicate in that more live situation or live scenario. So yes, that's the, the kind of, I think, well, I don't know, the long and short of it <laughs> in many ways. I think that tech question is, is a good one. Um, and one that I don't think necessarily has to mean, you know, constantly including cutting edge technology um, and instead really saying, well, what, just like we've simplified in person or more live public speeches, just sort of coalesce around a few themes, ceremonial, informative, persuasive. How are those 
core ideas still or still not being replicated in digital spaces? What do those look like? And what kind of differences do we want to change in terms of what we're asking students to perform? So one thing that I think we have to think about is not all public speeches, not all digital speeches are, are always someone's full body. So are there ways for us in this YouTube example to say, um, I want you to pick a particular frame and really focus on gestures and facial expressions and vocals, which don't necessarily require tons of new forms of technology, but just ask that we adjust the principles that we already know to this new format. And how do you assess a speech that's being done in this new, lack of a better term, unconventional way? Conventional being, you know, abiding by the the rules and the expectations that our discipline has maintained over the years? Good question. Um, you know, very similarly, well, I would, you know, it, sorry, it's a, good, it's a great question. Um, I think it's about really setting clear expectations for students. So, um, for example, if a student is going to be asked to do an interview over Zoom, the way that we would train them to do that interview is different than if they're going to be face to face. So if we're going to ask a student to give a presentation over Zoom, for example, really saying, what are the key things that we want them to practice in this first Zoom presentation? Um, so we still need to make sure that we can hear them. Here's what we want to be able to see. We need to be able to um, make sure that you're making eye contact and, and telling ourselves or asking ourselves, what does eye contact look like in a digital environment? Does that mean looking at the camera? Does it not? And talking through students, talking through with students, what, what's the difference in how that feels as an audience member? So um, I think one difficulty for many people in transitioning online without thinking about changing their grading rubrics or expectations is that we're, we're in that, that moment right now, which is that there's difficulty in figuring out feedback because we don't really have a lot of pre-established public speaking norms for that environment yet. Is this an area that you see yourself continuing to do investigation and scholarship in? I think so. I think it would be a, you know, because I'm someone who's more qualitative and critical, I think it would be a great opportunity for more of a mixed methods approach, really to kind of look at or think about what works or what doesn't work. And I, I'm hopeful that it, it's really going to ask us as a discipline to reframe public speaking, not as a course that you teach as a graduate student to get your PhD, or as or as a course that you know fuels or funnels enrollment for our department so that you can teach what you really want but actually as a location that's really ripe with areas of research and scholarship that we really have to be researching in order to answer some of these big questions that are no longer just affecting you know students in these courses but are affecting all of us as we're you know are tr you know, transitioning so much to communicating online well, this has been very interesting, very informative, and I think you and I definitely see eye to eye on a lot of these things, which has just made it, <laughs> as you've been talking, I've just been shaking my head. Yep, yep. <laughs> but, uh, I'm so glad to hear that. Not that I don't love a little dissent, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, this just about wraps up another episode. So thank you, Dr. Maggie Mapes, for talking with us tonight. I really enjoyed our conversation. And thank you all for listening to the Public Speaking Educators Forum. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Spotify and audible.com. Follow us on Twitter at PSEF Podcast. And be sure to tune in again real soon.